Hello, this is Erica with Launching Legacies. Welcome to our daily devotional. Today we are continuing a devotional that we started yesterday. It was the application from a um, from a dying friend and we were talking about Lazarus. And now today we are going to talk about the rest of the story with Lazarus. Now Lazarus is dead, okay? And Jesus knows Lazarus is dead, but Jesus is not with Mary and Martha who are Lazarus's sisters yet. So we're in John 11 and we are going to, I'm gonna skip down to the 17th verse. We kind of already talked about everything before that. Uh, there is an incidence in which Thomas, doubting Thomas, makes a comment, but we're going to disregard that for the time being because it just, it exemplifies the fact that he doesn't know what's about to go on, um, but we won't spend that much time there. Let's move on to the 17th verse. I encourage you, though, to look at what Thomas says to Jesus and, and work that out on your own. So when Jesus arrived at Bethany, um, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. So Bethany was only a few miles down from Jerusalem, and many of the people who he had come to, to had come to console, excuse me, had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. And then Mary, Martha got word that Jesus was coming. So she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. And Martha said to Jesus, when she sees him, remember this is, you know, Lazarus's sister. She says, uh, Lord, if only you had been here, my mother, um, I, excuse me, my brother would not have died. And so what happens is she says, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And I think that's just interesting because Martha is demonstrating an interesting faith that's not fully worked out yet. So let's keep hearing what happens. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. And so then she said, yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Okay, so she's thinking about the resurrection of the believers, right? But that's not what Jesus is talking about. And so Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she said, yes, Lord. She told him, I always believe, I have always believed you are the Messiah, the son of God, and the one who had come into the world from God. And then she returned to Mary and she called Mary aside and told in front of, um, when away from the mourners and told her the teacher wants, uh, is here and he wants to see you. And so Mary immediately went to him and Jesus had stayed outside the village at the place where Martha met him. And when the people were at the house consoling Mary, Mary saw her leaving so hastily they assumed that she was going to Lazarus's grave to go weep so they followed her okay and when Mary arrived and saw Jesus she fell at his feet and said Lord if only you had been here my brother would not have died right and when Jesus saw her weeping and saw that the other people were wailing with her a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled where have you put him he asked them all right, so here goes. Let's talk a little bit about this real quick, break, briefly. Um, when it was time for people to mourn, at this time in this culture, they had people who would be like professional mourners, okay? And some people weren't even professionals, but they would just come to mourn. And so they would exaggerate their weeping. Like, oh, oh. Even if they didn't know the person really well, they would be weeping and mourning with an exaggerated tone, okay? It was part of the culture. It just would happen when, when people died, okay? And so we know that Jesus knows that these people don't fully understand what he's doing and why he's there. But it seems that he gets into this deep anger and he's going to get angry again before the passage is over. Um, he gets into this deep anger because, one, because there's a, a lot of falsehood going on in this, this process of mourning. It's not deep, deep, sincere mourning. But Jesus deeply and sincerely loved Lazarus. It really was his friend. And so you kind of got this fake shenanigan type of thing going on that has a cultural foundation. So it's not just people, you know, being weird. But it, all, it has a cultural significance. But it really is isn't significant right right I mean it is what they practice but it's not necessarily helpful in any way and so they're mourning and weeping and following Mary thinking that she's gonna weep so they're gonna weep with her and it's kind of a way of tr trying to be nice to her but it's it's different when you see it happen you'll be like interesting so uh we know that dynamic exists because it's a cultural dynamic that would have gone on there and so possibly this is why 
Jesus is mad, but he, I mean, angry. He also knows though that they don't understand him. They do not know what he's doing and how his power through Christ, I mean, through God is working. We do know that he doesn't get that. So he wells up with anger and he's deeply troubled. And he says, where have you put them in? So he asked them, okay. So they told him, uh, Lord, come and see. And G- then Jesus wept and the people were standing there nearby. See how much he loved them. And, but some said this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Okay. And so, um, they were like, you know, well, he's able to do this. So why didn't he come and do this before? And then now when it says that Jesus wept, there's many people who are like, well, he wept because he was grieving. Well, he wept because of this and he wept because of that. I'll just say this. I have a problem with the idea that he wept because he was grieving because he had no reason to grieve right? The grief that he may have felt was the grief for these people, not for Lazarus, because Lazarus is about to rise again. So I'm not sure why, why, um, it's widely accepted or widely discussed that he's weeping for his friend that's dead when in fact he already knew from beginning to end that he was going to rise him from the dead and so for me that's a a paradigm shift that we made in the first devotional is to say he couldn't be weeping because of grief because there's no reason to grieve if you know this thing is about to turn around not only is it about to turn around you're about to perform the miracle that does turn it around it's like saying I'm hungry while I'm cooking food and you know and fainting you know I'm saying I'm cooking so as soon as I finish cooking then I'll eat right so there's not a lot of I don't, I don't really personally connect with that um, that way of interpreting this portion of scripture but perhaps you see it different and that's fine but I just want to put it in your mind that he does know he's going to raise Lazarus from the death the, the, the grave and what he also knows is that these people don't understand him he also knows that, that some of the things they're practicing and some of the things they're doing don't give God glory. And to me, that is more worthy of weeping than the thing that you're, the miracle you're actually about to perform right now. I don't need to be sad about that. So I don't know. You think about that and uh, make your own uh, position because it doesn't tell us. Um, the people assume that he loved him so much and that's why he was crying. But the people didn't know a lot. Okay. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. All right. So. Um, so then they were kind of spect- spec- uh, skeptical anyway, though, because they wanted to know why, if he could do all the other miracles he did, why he didn't come and save Lazarus from dying. So anyhow, moving on to the 38th verse, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. And see, that is the part that makes me like, mm, is this the stages of grief? No, why would you go through the stages of grief if you know you're about to resurrect someone? Mm, I don't know. So anyhow, he seems to be upset with the people. That's that's my position here, but let's move on. As he arrived at the tomb, a cave um, with a stone rolled across it was his entrance. And he says to the people, roll the stone away. Okay. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been there for four days. Like the smell is going to be terrible. And Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Okay. So they rolled the stone aside and then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake that these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out and his hands and feet bound in grave clothes and his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go interesting extremely interesting okay so this is a very interesting passage to me and it's because of the first part of the passage that makes the second part even more dynamically interesting yesterday i said when i was doing the devotional part one of this devotional that it's important that you understand there are times in your life and places in your life that if if you don't if God doesn't get the freedom to move, you won't even know that he can move in that way. Like you're just not even, you cannot conceptualize how good and how powerful and how dynamic God can be. And Romans 8, 28 says that things are going to work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. But here goes the thing. 
he's going to work it out his way, not your way, by your understanding, by your thoughts, by your processes. And you have here these people who are grieving or pretending to grieve with these sisters, and they have a way of understanding this. Mary and Martha, they both say the same thing. Like, if you had been here, you could have saved them because that's their understanding. And even though they called Jesus the Messiah, and even though they believe that God sent them, they still have no idea of understanding how powerful he truly is. They can't conceptualize that. And so the application for this portion of the story is this. Yes, Jesus loved Lazarus. That is true. But when he gets to this place and he has to deal with the naysayers and the doubters and those who believe but don't fully understand, he does, he becomes angry. The scripture says he becomes angry or upset because he's dealing with people who want to put him in a box. And they've already put his friend in the grave. And so they feel like they already understand what's about to happen. They already know the extent of what God can do. And I'm going to say this. No one knows the extent of what God can do. And now you may not know how he's going to act. You, not, you may not know exactly what his next move is. You, you won't be able to strategize above God. I can let you know that. But you don't know the extent of what he's capable of. And because you don't know the extent of what he's capable of, the application here is to trust him. That yet, yeah, even his own friend, he needed to let him go to the grave in order to see the glory of God be made manifest. And even though he talked about it and they people agreed with it and they kind of seemed like they were on the right page, it didn't ever work out the way they thought it was going to work out. These people are amazed that, that Lazarus has risen from the grave. They're amazed from their fake mourning and weeping and some of their sincere weeping and mourning to this place of complete awe. They are standing in awe of what God can do because who raises people from the dead? Well, I'll tell you who raises people from the dead. Jesus does. And he has things in your life that he can do that you don't even understand or can conceptualize that he will do. But he'll do it just like he did here. Why? Because he's faithful. And because his love is unending. And even though sometimes I'm sure, I am positive that we make him as angry as these other weepers and mourners do. He's still faithful to us despite all that. He's faithful to us. Even though we don't even know what to ask for. We couldn't even begin to know where to petition him. He's faithful to us. And he'll be faithful to you. So I want to encourage you to read John the 11th chapter. Read all of it. Deal with Thomas and his doubt. And his he thinks Jesus is about to go die. Um, <laughs> read all of it. Um, and, and take it in. And consider this. That God is able to do things you haven't even begun to ask him to do. And although we can't, like I said, figure out his strategy. Because that's not our job. We can do this. We can trust him more. Trust him more. We can put more faith in him. And I want you to, to think about doing that. Today's Friday. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. We will be back tomorrow. Um, No, we won't be back tomorrow. We'll be back Monday with another devotional. And until then, please pray for us. We'll be praying for you. And we hope that you have a blessed and amazing weekend. Don't forget to worship. All right.